I know I was four years old, and it was winter when I first had the dream. Uh, the foot of my bed was under the window, and outside the window there was a row of old walnut trees. When I told it to Freud in 1910, I was 23 and had gonorrhea. Yes, I've had bad luck with my member all my life. <laughs> My patient told me about the dream very early on in the treatment. We often come back to the dream. We have been returning to the dream for three years now. I'm lying in my bed. The foot of my bed was under the window, and outside the window there was a row of old walnut trees. Suddenly the window opened of its own accord. <laughs> wolves in the trees. I'm looking out of the window now and I can't see a wolf. No, not even a white one. You're dreaming. It's just a dream there. Shh now. Is it possible the dream reminded you of something that might have taken place at an earlier age? What would it remind me of? All the material that makes up the content of a dream is derived in some way from experience. When I was 23, I was shameless. I told Freud that I could only copulate with women in the manner of beasts and with women of an inferior class to my own. When I first met him, I was nervous and keen to tell him I was a man of means. Herr Professor, having inherited money from both my father and my uncle's estate in St. Petersburg, your fee is of no great concern to me. It is very important to him for me to know that he is rich. This Russian aristocrat is an unrepentant swank who regards his wealth as his greatest personal asset. What is your method, may I inquire? You will lie down on the couch, and I will sit on a chair positioned behind your head. You should say out loud whatever comes into your mind, just the way the thoughts come. I was suffering from phobias and depression, and I'd fallen in love with my nurse, Therese, who looked after me in the sanatorium in Munich. My family were not happy about my marrying such a woman. The wives of Russian aristocrats are supposed to be able to speak French and certainly not have a job. <laughs> but I was violently in love. Our rendezvous took place in her humble room. You see, my family lived on a large country estate near Odessa. Sergei Pankyayev. Every childhood has a story and everything it is possible to remember about that story will eventually emerge in the course of my cure with you. There was once upon a time an old mother goat. She had seven little kids and loved them just as any mother loves her children. If my mother has more babies, then I won't be the youngest she anymore. She to go into the forest and fetch some food. So she said, my beloved children, I have to go into the forest, so be on your guard against the wolf. Nanya! If you open the door and let the wolf in, he will devour you. All your skin, your eyes, your ears, your hair and everything. He will say he loves you, but he really wants to eat you. Nanya! Ooh, what's wrong with your brother? He's scared the wolf is going to gobble him up. Oh, you're such a timid little boy. You should have been the girl and your sister should have been the boy. Your mother is dressed and ready to see you. In those days, we formally kissed our mother's hand every morning and evening. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, Mother. Good morning, Sergei. Good morning, Mother. Mama. I'm afraid of seeing terrible things in my dreams. 
Did you recite your prayers last night? Yes, for a long time. And I made the sign of the cross one hundred times. It is best to be thankful. When you were three months old, you were so ill they made you a shroud, just in case. <laughs> May I kiss your hand again, Mama? You know I have stomach pain, Sergei. I cannot go on living like this. My dear doctor, I cannot go on living like this. Those were your mother's words. You have committed them to memory, and now you use them yourself. It is as if you identify with your mother's despondent approach to life. Nanya. Mom. The children are to be guarded against the outbreak of dysentery that has made an appearance in the vicinity of our estate. Yes, ma'am. You may all leave my room now. Please close the door, Nanya. Nanya, am I going to die? No, of course not. But you do remind me of my own son, who died when he was a baby. I must breathe in three times. <sighs> so, for Nanya, you were a substitute for her own son. <laughs> Did you tell yourself, I must breathe in this way to stop myself from dying? Perhaps. Why do you look so scared, my poor little Sergei? Everything scares my brother. Your poor little Sergei is cruel. He stamps on beetles and cuts up caterpillars. Anna! Your father's calling you. He wants me to read to him. But it's always so dark in his room, I can barely see the page. Do you know who Lermontov is, Sergei? No. He's a great Russian poet and Papa's favourite writer. He died in a duel. He was shot. Dead. Where are you, Anna? I'm coming, Father. <laughs> Do up the buckle of your shoe first. I don't care if it's undone. Well, then let me brush your hair for you at least. I don't want to be neat or pretty for my father. He doesn't care. My father loves her more than me. Vegius Konstantinovich Pankyev. I love you so much I could gobble you up. What are you thinking about, Sergei? My cousin was born with six toes and they cut the extra one off with an axe. Oh, why don't you run around in the garden? I found a little bird in the grass. It had fallen out of the nest. Nanya, where do babies come from? They come from the mother's bottom. Your mother loves you so much because you're the youngest child. I think it must have just been born because it still hadn't got its feathers. It filled me with dread. Oh, how can you be frightened of a tiny bird? Did the bird remind you of a child? No. But your relationship with your elder sister had given you cause to think a great deal about how older children relate to younger ones. I was scared of butterflies as well. <gasps> It's not possible to be scared of a butterfly. I don't like the way their wings open and close. What are you doing with your hands? You must not touch yourself there. That's a naughty thing to do. Children who do that get a wound there. You are old and ugly and you stink. When I was four, I tore the wings off flies. I took pleasure in tormenting small creatures and insects. I had an orgy of cutting up caterpillars. I see. The little insects were your rivals. They are the babies whose arrival is still possible. And I tormented my beloved Narnia. Sometimes I, I would make her burst into tears. These are entirely active, sadistic pursuits. And masochistic. I had fantasies at this time in, in which boys were punished for something and were beaten. I imagined I was taken into rooms and beaten too. So, you raged against all the tiny creatures, the caterpillars and insects. These all signified tiny children in your mind. My sister was two years older than me. Yes. She committed suicide when she was twenty. You don't sound at all sad. I began the cure, and on it went. 
It went on for years. And in that time, I was anxious to marry Therese, but I was not permitted to see her until Freud said I was ready. Uh, he told me that every adult neurosis builds on childhood neurosis. Like an archaeologist, he would have to dig into my mind to find fragments of the past and attempt to piece them together. I do not wish to talk about my sister. You are old and ugly, and I detest the weather in Vienna. I do not love you. This is the truth. <laughs> I do not love you. This is the truth. And not for me is your beauty splendor. In you I love instead what I remember, and the destruction of my youth. You say you need to be helped to dress and to go about your toilet. So, am I right in thinking that you are taking the cure with me because you want to live a more independent existence? I feel cut off from everything, as if the world is shrouded in a veil. It's like twilight, as if I am living in twilight. I detest the grandfather clock in your consulting room. I'll have to shut my eyes so as not to see it. What is it you do not wish to see? There is a little goat, Professor, hiding in the clock case. Pankyeyev suffers from an obsessional neurosis. He fears he will be devoured by a wolf. The wolf will find him hiding in my clock case. You are silent, Dr. Freud. Are you going to gobble me up? At this moment, I am the wolf. His timidity at the prospect of an independent existence is so great that it outweighs all the hardships of being sick. Let us turn to your relationship with your father. He wanted to gobble me up too. Our son is murdering the great work of Tchaikovsky. Look at his poor face. He is so pale and thin. That's because he only eats barley sugar sticks. <laughs> I lost all pleasure in eating when I was a child. It is well known that in girls going through puberty, we encounter a neurosis that expresses the rejection of sexuality through nervosa. It is more unusual in boys. I only wanted sweet things to eat. Uh, cakes and bonbons and barley sugar. When they occur in dreams, sweets and bonbons generally stand for caresses and sexual satisfaction. What kind of son looks at a meat broth and screams like a girl? I'm a girl and I don't scream. No, no, no. You are intelligent and strong, and you write almost as well as Lermontov. Uh, uh, he is tormenting me. Try not to scare him. You said you became very pious. Yes. Every night I stood on a chair and kissed the paintings of the saints on my wall. I could not sleep until I had done this. So... You began to be afraid of God the Father? I have always only wanted to be a gentleman like my father. Sigius Konstantinovich Pankyev, I love you so much I want to eat you. I became obsessive. I had blasphemous thoughts for which I imposed great penance on myself. When making the sign of the cross, I, I had to breathe in deeply each time or exhale loudly. In Russian... Breath is the same word for spirit. Here we find a higher form of sexual suppression. It was possible to love the father now called God with an intensity that you had striven in vain to vent on your own earthly father. You scoundrel, you take my money and make me miserable. I longed for my father's caresses. 
My hand hurts. I hate the violin. I hate all this scratching. Oh, then give the instrument to Anna. Yes, Papa. You hold the bow like this, Sergei. I think your fingers are too small. Oh, nonsense. His fingers are not too small to cross himself all the time. The violin is the same thing. He has to train his fingers to land in the right places. And you put your chin here. Look at how I'm holding the bow, Sergei. So, you feared your father? Perhaps. I used to enjoy walking with him around the estate. Mm. The sheep are ill. I'm going to have to send out for one of Pasteur's disciples who will inoculate them. Who is Pasteur? Dr. Pasteur is a great pioneer of science. Your sister is also very talented when it comes to the natural sciences. Look at its white throat. Quiet now. I'm going to kill it. I'll hit it with my walking stick. Walk with me. There it is. Stop crying now. Nanya will give you a stick of barley sugar when we get back. Barley sugar is like a snake. It's a chopped up little bit of snake. So, your father had become the terrifying figure who threatens castration. I'm going to have to throw my borscht in your face and kick you around the room. <sighs> you are exhausting me. Your apathy, your passivity. You listen and you understand... But you let nothing come near you. I told you you were going to gobble me up. I am going to set a deadline for this treatment. It is stagnating. You have one further month of the cure with me. No, it no. It is often the case in analysis that new material surfaces in the memory once the end is inside. You, you're vermin, Freud. You... Vermin in a dream usually represents a small child. You said you had the means to cure me. Instead, you have depressed me utterly. I will have to pay a visit to my tailor to lift my spirits. A new coat and a suit, Herr Pankyayev. Oh, well, of course, I, I shall start straight away. Could you cut the shoulders a little wider to exaggerate the chest? Certainly. I can assure you my designs for this season will satisfy your tastes. For your suit, Herr Pankayev, a double-breasted style looks best on a slender form, such as your own. <laughs> I've just fitted an extremely corpulent gentleman and suggested he adhere strictly to stripe effects in the fabric. I happen to know he likes nothing better than to devour goose livers simmered with onions for breakfast. Please, um, could you close the window? I would prefer natural light for your fitting, Herr Pankayev. A tailor cannot work with a window open. An animal might jump in, and if it does, you will have to grab its tail. An animal, Herr Pankayev? There are no animals in my establishment. <laughs> but, 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 but if it is your wish, I will certainly do as you say. Thank you. I would prefer that the trousers of my suit be cut with a, a straight leg and a high waist. Certainly. I... I understand a man of your taste would prefer a plain finished hem and no pressed crease. Uh, do, do you hunt, Herr Pankayev? Uh, if so, I suggest you consider breeches made up in a heavy tweed. Hunt? Uh, certainly not. To put down your scissors! Um, uh, I can see there is a small window open to the right of the room in addition to the one you have just closed. Climb onto the chair and attend to it. It is interesting that you asked your tailor to put down his scissors. My grandfather warned me about a tailor just like him. Grandpa lived on a farm near Odessa. Do you know why a tailor must always shut his windows, Sergei? No. 
a tailor was sitting in his room sewing when, one day, the window opened and in leapt a grey wolf. The tailor grabbed him by the tail and pulled it right off. So the wolf ran away with no tail. Some time later, the tailor was walking in the woods when he suddenly saw a pack of wolves coming towards him. What do you think he did? He quickly climbed up a tree. Yes! At first, the wolves did not know what to do, but the maimed grey wolf, who was also there and wanted his revenge on the tailor, suggested... All the wolves climb on each other's backs so that the very last one could reach the tailor. They did what he said. But the tailor recognized the wolf who visited him, the one he punished, and he shouted, Grab the grey fellow by the tail! If I remember this fairy tale correctly, the wolf who has lost his tail suddenly runs away, terrified, so that all the other wolves standing on his back tumble down in a heap. Yes. Yes, I forgot that. But you remembered it in your dream. Did I? What did I remember? What Freud has invented is bizarre and miraculous. For he believes that some childhood experience, a trauma, is the cause of an illness. And if one remembers this event, one gets one's health back. We often come back to the dream. We have been returning to the dream for three years now. The patient told me about the dream very early on in the treatment. I'm four years old and I'm lying in my bed. The foot of my bed was under the window and outside the window there was a row of old walnut trees. I know it was winter when I had the dream and night time. Suddenly the window opened of its own accord and I was terrified to see that some white wolves were sitting on the big walnut tree in front of the window. <laughs> in the tree. Shh. I'm looking out of the window now and I can't see a wolf. No, not even a white one. You're dreaming. It's just a dream. There. Shh, now. We know that your sister read you fairy stories. Yes. I felt nothing at the news of her death. Nothing. I felt barely a trace of pain. And yet his sister was, for him, the most beloved member of his family. Despite seeing her as an uncomfortable rival for his parents' approval. I am looking now for some sort of substitute for the outburst of pain that failed to take place in my patient when she took her life. Your sister's name was Anna? Mm. Anna Konstantinovna. When she was older, all she ever did was sit around with a book. She should have been a man. She wrote poetry and was so talented. I don't know why she killed herself. She was my father's favourite. One day, I was three years old. I was chasing a lovely big butterfly with my net. It had large wings with yellow stripes and a pointed tip. A swallowtail, perhaps. Suddenly, as the butterfly settled on a flower, I was overcome by a terrible fear of it, and I ran away screaming. What is the word for butterfly in your own language? Babushka. It also means little granny. Ah. Butterflies make me think of girls. Beetles and caterpillars make me think of boys. It must have been a memory of a female, then. 
which had awakened in you some anxiety about that butterfly. Perhaps the yellow stripes on the wings reminded you of similar stripes on an item of clothing worn by a woman. Nonsense, dear Freud. I'm going to have to knock that cigar out of your mouth if you continue like this. It's true. My conjectures can be very inadequate. It is just a suggestion. It is the way the butterfly's wings opened and closed. Once it had settled that gave me such an uncanny feeling. Let us imagine this butterfly. It has settled on a flower. It opens its yellow wings and then it closes its wings. Its pointed tips touch and it makes the shape of a V. The Roman numeral for five. Yes. And this shape, this V shape, which is also the Roman numeral for five, is the time of day you say you always get depressed. Freud was a genius. If you had seen him, he was a fascinating personality. He had very serious eyes that looked down to the bottom of the soul. But he was not a thought reader. He did something else. What is it that happened at five o'clock at twilight that caused you such anxiety? No idea. Absolutely blank. In fact, I've stopped listening to you. I shall lie here and plan my summer holiday in Odessa. The wings opening and closing make the shape of a woman opening her legs. I would never have thought of that myself. Around that time I had a nursery maid who was very fond of me. She, she had the same name as my mother. No, she, um, she could not have had the same name. Her real name was Grusha. On our first estate, I used to go into the storeroom where fruit was kept after it had been picked. I remember the pears. There was a particular pear with yellow striped skin. In my language, the word for pear is Grusha. It thus became clear that behind the cover memory of the butterfly he had chased, there lay, concealed, the memory of this nursery maid. The yellow stripes, then, were not on her dress, but on the pair whose name she shared. All the women I fall in love with are substitutes for this one servant girl. And you thought she shared your mother's name. That is your fear of the yellow stripe on the butterfly. Her memory has merged with your mother. Do you have a dog, Freud? My favourite chow is called Joffy. I regard dogs as untouched by the conflicts human beings have to suffer. We can love dogs without ambivalence. But you do not love me. Because you've given me my marching orders. He wants me to love him. But I am merely an impartial observer. Perhaps you should read again. The fairy tales that caused you such horror as a child. I'm looking for a book. What is the title, Herr Pankayov? It is a children's picture book, a fairy tale from my childhood, the tale of the seven little kids. I have one edition. It is from the Brothers Grimm, uh, on that shelf there. If you would be so kind as to get it down for me. There is one particular illustration I need to see. Can you describe it? Sergei, I've got something to show you. Shut your eyes. What is it? I'll count to three and then open your eyes. One, two, three. What are you doing to your brother? I'm showing him a picture in my storybook. 
the picture I'm looking for is very particular. It is of a, a, a wolf standing on its hind legs with one foot forward, paw outstretched, and ears pricked. I can't see it here, but there is this one. The wolf has dipped his black paw into white flour to trick the little goats into opening the door. You are shaking, Herr Pankayev. May I offer you a chair? Yes. Lock the door. It was not long before someone knocked at the door and called out. Open the door, my beloved children. I have a delicious morsel for each one of you. The little kids cried out. First show us your paw, so we may know that you are truly our mother. So the wolf waved his paw inside the window. And when they saw that it was white, they eagerly opened the door. Soon afterwards, Mother Goat came home from the woods. Oh, what a dreadful sight she saw. The door stood wide open. All the furniture was smashed to pieces, and the covers and pillows had all been chewed up. She looked for her children, but they were nowhere to be found. She dropped to the floor, and heartbroken began to sob. But as she cried, the door of the grandfather clock swung open, and out jumped her youngest black kid. "Mama, mama!" he wailed. "Something terrible has happened." Something terrible has happened to my sister. I'm sorry to hear that, Herr Hanke. No, you're not. You just want my money. You feel nothing at all. I would like us to return to the loss of your sister. When she died, it was a relief to think I would not need to share our parents' inheritance with her. <laughs> it is striking the calm way he tells me this, as if he has no comprehension of the coarseness of feeling to which he is admitting. In her early twenties, she grew morose and complained that she was not pretty enough. She withdrew from all social contact and was sent away on a tour in the company of an older lady, a, a friend of the family. And soon afterwards, she went away again on another journey. She travelled on her own this time, and something happened. My sister shot herself. No, she poisoned herself. What am I to make of this error in his narrative? When I heard about her death, I was pleased. I can't think why she took her own life in this terrible way. <laughs> My daughter died such a long way from home. I would never have guessed she was unhappy. Here, take my handkerchief. Thank you. Sometimes. I've become so terrible. Yes. Oh, I know that you are suffering without your sister, Sergey. It is hard to bear. But you had a thought that made you ashamed. I had a scandalous thought. Now I am the only child. Yes. Now I am the only child. And my father must love me and me alone. It is to be supposed that his pain at the loss of the most beloved member of his family would be inhibited in its expression by continued jealousy towards her. And something else too. The intrusion of his unconsciously felt incestuous love. Sergey, I've got something to show you. What is it? What is it? <laughs> It's only a picture in my storybook, Sergey. What else would it be? I don't know. A few months after my sister's death, I made a journey to find the grave of a poet I had great respect for, Lermontov. I found his grave, and stood there gazing at the sky. And then at the stone, and something incomprehensible happened. <laughs> I 
couldn't think why I was weeping over the grave of this poet. I knew that more than two generations had passed since his death. Where was the grave? It was quite near the region where my sister had died. So your tears were for your sister? P perhaps. Do you know who Lermontov is, Sergei? No. He's a great Russian poet and Papa's favourite writer. He died in a duel. He was shot. Dead. I cannot go on living like this! I do not love you. This is the truth. And not for me is your beauty splendor. In you I love instead what I remember, and the destruction of my youth. Anna drank poison. Mercury. But the poet you mentioned had been shot in a duel. Yes. Two years later, my father took a lethal overdose of veronal and died. I could not begin to cope with everyday concerns. I consulted some of the most eminent psychiatrists in Europe. Piekterev in Petersburg, Zian in Berlin, Krepelin in Munich. It seems to me that you thought you were paying homage to Lermontov. But in fact, you were weeping for your sister. Do you understand that you sought out the grave of the poet in order to mourn your sister? No. No, I... I don't understand at all. <laughs> Again, we return to the dream. I know that it was winter. I was three or four at the time, certainly no more than five. I dreamt that it was night and that I was lying in my bed. Suddenly the window opens of its own accord and terrified I see there are a number of white wolves sitting in the big walnut tree outside the window. There were six or seven of them. The wolves were white all over and looked more like foxes or sheepdogs because they had big tails like foxes and their ears were, were pricked up like dogs when they pay attention to something. He always related this dream to the memory that in those childhood years he would express a quite monstrous anxiety at the picture of a wolf that was to be found in his book of fairy tales. You say the wolves are white. What does that make you think of? Dying sheep. So there was death in your dream. How did the wolves get up the tree? You told me very early on about an old tailor who climbs a tree to get away from a wolf. Yes. In the story, he pulls off the wolf's tail and the wolf wants to punish him. So, this is the tree the wolves are sitting on in your dream. There is also a clear link with the castration complex, however. The wolf loses his tail to the tailor. The tailor has castrated the tail. You are a scoundrel. I'm going to pour borscht all over your head and beat you. Yes, I understand this is your way of being affectionate. Tell me again what it is you asked your old nurse. Is it true that if I touch myself here, it will fall off? That is what I told you, and it's true. You will have a wound there. <laughs> You said the wolves in your dream have big tails like foxes. These, I have no doubt, are compensation for the absence of a tail. I do not know why there were six or seven wolves in the tree. You do know. Do I? You have told me how your sister read to you the story of the wolf and the seven little kids. Here we find the number six. For the wolf gobbles up only six of the little kids, while the seventh hides in the clock case. <laughs> The wolves in your dream are white because we also find white in this fairy tale. Do we? The wolf has the baker whiten his grey paws so that the kids do not recognize him. It is possible the wolf 
represents your infantile fear of your father. Uh, improbable. You are an idiot. And you have an ambivalent attitude towards any father substitute. We can see this now in your behavior towards me. I have been afraid of my father all my life. I am thinking about the part of your dream in which the windows suddenly open of their own accord. It, it might not have been the windows. My eyes suddenly opened. I was asleep and suddenly woke up and then I saw the wolves in the trees. I have nothing to object to here, but we can take this further. You say you woke up and saw something. The attentive gaze which you attribute to the wolves is actually to be ascribed to you. It is your gaze on the wolves that is attentive. What is it the child might have watched with such attention before this dream occurred? The tree was a Christmas tree. It was not a walnut tree. It was Christmas Eve. The day before my birthday, I was about to turn four, and I was excited about Christmas Day, which is also my birthday. I would receive two lots of presents. Yes, there would have been presents for me on the tree. But the presents turned into wolves. In your dream, you are remembering something you have forgotten. But it is there all the same, hidden from your conscious mind. You scoundrel! You take my money and repeat yourself endlessly. I do remember something else. I was nearly two years old and I was suffering from malaria. <sighs> oh, the fever and lassitude that is malaria. The hour is up. You look tense, dear Freud, as if you have a mild headache. I'm off now for my fencing lesson. My teacher is a former Italian officer who has a club here in Vienna. Ah, lighter! Lighter on your feet, it's like a down! Your goal is to strike me with your blade without being hit yourself, but you have not once achieved it. Ah. If this was a duel, I would have killed you by now. I, 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 I cannot continue. Block my attack. Go. Come on, block, Go. block, block. I'm very blocked. Ow. Pains in my abdomen. I, I'm, need, I'm in need of plum or prune juice. Uh, oh. Oh. I have now penetrated you with my blade. Oh. Oh. You've got my finger. It's bleeding profusely. Can't you see it? It's hanging by its skin. You ridiculous pokey Your finger is untouched. There is no blood. You're right. I apologize. When I was five years old, I was carving with my pocket knife into the bark of one of the walnut trees, and suddenly to my unspeakable terror, I noticed that I cut through the little finger on my left hand. At last I calmed down, took a look at the finger, and saw that it was entirely uninjured. <laughs> oh, I do not understand you Russians. Perhaps you should see a doctor. Yes, I already do. My doctor smokes a great deal. Almost all the time he, he asks me about my dreams. And you pay him money? Mm. Lots of it. We return to the dream. We always return to the dream. What is it that was at work in the night all those years ago in Odessa? The child, like the adult, can only produce fantasies with material that he has acquired from... somewhere. I have a very early memory. 
I was nearly two years old and I was suffering from malaria. For this reason, I was asleep in a cot in my parents' room. I woke up, possibly because it was a hot summer's afternoon, to find that my parents were only half-dressed. In fact, that they were in their undergarments. And what colour were their undergarments? White. White? Like the white wolves in the tree? Perhaps. And were your parents asleep? Oh, no. My mother and father were engaged in coitus. I see. Coitus Aturga. You are saying that your father was positioned behind your mother. <laughs> he was standing behind my mother with one foot forward, looming over her. I see. Were his paws outstretched and his ears pricked? <gasps> Now we understand. It is not the fear of the father that comes into consciousness, but fear of the wolf. You yourself say you fear the wolf when it is in a standing position. In the story, your grandfather told you the wolves climb onto each other's backs in order to reach the tailor hiding in the tree. Therefore, we can say that in this primal scene in the bedroom in Odessa, your mother and father have turned into wolves. Your mother played the castrated wolf in the story. You rascal. What castrated wolf? The wolf who lost his tail because the tailor pulled it off. He is the castrated wolf. And your mother is the castrated wolf too. She has let your father climb onto her back. From this you learn that to be loved by your father, you will have to be castrated. Dear Freud, you are right. I... And what about my Latin master? Who is this person? I've, for I've forgotten his name. Yes, it took me a while to recall my Latin master's full name. <laughs> a Freud did not prompt me. He said nothing. And the clock ticked, and I stared at the wall. This teacher asked me something. To translate a word into Latin, I... I've forgotten the word. And then I remembered the word. It still makes me shudder. The word was son. As in the son of a father. You, cringing in the second row. What is the Latin word for son? The word, sir, is feast. No, that is French. Repeat after me, Phileus. Phileus. And don't call me sir. You address me by my name. Yes, sir. Have you forgotten my name? Yes, sir. My name is Mr. Wolf. Repeat after me, Phileus. Filius. Filius. Konstantinovich Pankyev. I love you so much, I want to eat you. The Latin for son is Filius, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Freud was fascinated by Mr. Wolf. He wanted to bring into the light what was hidden inside me. So the teacher was also a father substitute. Mr. Wolf was indeed still the father. Yes. But the coitus atergo, it must be a fantasy. I probably was not asleep in my parents' bedroom. Children of my class slept in their nurses' room. But you tell me you witnessed this primal scene. Whether it is fantasy or not is irrelevant. You were asleep. And then your eyes suddenly opened, and what you watched with full attention was your papa, the wolf, standing behind your mother. Professor, the wolves in my dream were merely sitting placidly in a tree, a walnut or Christmas tree. They were not engaged in coitus. Experience has convinced me that in a dream a tall tree is a symbol of observation and voyeurism. When sitting on top of a tree, one can see everything going on below, just as you saw your parents. You were watching their actions with tense attentiveness. <sighs> you, 
You think the wolves are white because they are the colour of my dear mother and father's undergarments? Yes. And they are white because of the white of the bed linen. It remains one of the strictest laws of dream interpretation that an explanation can be found for every detail. In addition, there is the white of the flocks of sheep you observed while walking with your father. <laughs> you are a genius, Freud, no doubt about it. Help yourself to another cigar. Do, uh, do you smoke in the bath? Let me tell you that the wolves in my dream were not in the least terrifying. They were quite calm. Yes, they were calm. The opposite of the violent excitement the child felt when he observed his parents at Turgo. You have merely reversed this in your dream and found the opposite of excitement. I now understand your need to exhale three times as a boy. You told yourself, I must breathe in this way to stop myself from dying. In fact, you were imitating the sounds your father made when you witnessed him having intercourse with your mother. Scoundrel! I was not even three years old. And what time do you think you observed your mother and father taking their siesta? It was five o'clock. This is the time you experience severe depression. You say it is like living in twilight. You have often said the world for you is shrouded by a veil. Yes. When you observed the primal scene between your mother and father, you were suffering from malaria. Correct. It is likely then that a mosquito net was placed over your crib and when you woke up, you had to tear it away to see more clearly. I don't remember a mosquito net. But I do recall having heard that I was born in a call. For this reason, I'd always thought I was very lucky and no harm could befall me. For the last month, I have rationed myself to 20 cigars a day. Now I will break my rule. I am about to light the 21st. They are small cigars, after all. It is as if I am cut off from the world. The veil shrouding you from the world was this call. My dear Freud, I'm not in the least overwhelmed with gratitude. You tell me my fear of being devoured by the wolf was my fear of my father. You tell me I observed my parents in the act of coitus and saw my mother lacked a penis. You tell me this led me to believe that the price of being loved by my father was castration. And you tell me that the veil between myself and the world is the call in which I was born. Am I cured? If it's true that everything originates in childhood and that when everything is remembered, the illness disappears, I must now be well. I don't feel well. To become well, one must want to get well. It is like a ticket one buys to travel. I have given you the ticket. But you are not obliged to travel. This is your choice. It is your decision. Go and find Therese in Munich. From what you tell me, you have looked for a woman you consider inferior because that is what you do. But in her, you have discovered someone kind. Someone good for you. The misery you have felt in the cure with me has contributed to the stability of your recovery. I was overwhelmingly grateful to Freud. Oh yes, I married Therese. I spent 30 years working for an insurance company and I conducted myself more or less normally. Do I still suffer from obsessive ideas? Do I still dream dreams that disturb me? Do I still prefer borscht to apple strudel? I don't want to discuss any of this. It's a catastrophe. A few years after finishing psychoanalysis with Freud, I developed a strange delusion. When I stared at my reflection in the mirror, I noticed a strange spot on my nose. I became convinced that a doctor had drilled a hole in my face. Oh, 
Yes, it's a catastrophe, for I, who am madder than Freud, have outlived Freud. Ah, he was a genius. He could speak English, French, Greek, Latin. He mapped the inner world and unveiled the power of sexual desire. Oh, I loved him and hated him, but the 20th century was Freud's century. His couch was draped in an opulent oriental rug, a magic carpet on which I recovered strange dreams and fantasies and mourned the death of my sister. You see, in those days, the psychological was completely ignored. I became his most famous patient. He called me the Wolf Man. What good are the passions? For sooner or later, their sweet sickness ends when reason speaks up. And life, if surveyed with cold-blooded regard, is stupid and empty, a joke.